Moon Knight is Marvel's very own psychologically fractured hero. While many who might not know any better try to say he's just some sort of Batman knockoff, they could not be further from the truth. While there's a couple similarities, their origins, abilities, and fighting styles are wildly different. Moon Knight's alter ego is known as Mark Spector. Living through some terribly traumatic events, Mark Spector developed dissociative identity disorder, which many people think of as multiple personality disorder. He cut his own path through life by becoming a boxer, then eventually becoming a marine, and finally a CIA operative. Eventually getting fed up with the organization itself, he went out on his own and became a mercenary. And while I don't want to spoil too much since the Marvel show is just about to come out, a series of events leave him near death, and he finds a statue of an Egyptian god known as Khonshu. Khonshu imbues Mark Spector with enhanced abilities. And many of these abilities, depending on which comic you read, revolve around the cycles of the moon. It's said that this Egyptian god was able to connect with Mark Spector so well because of his fractured mind. The abilities Mark Spector already had before even possessing the power of Khonshu, or his hand-to-hand -hand combat skills as a boxer, mastery of weapons being trained by the military and CIA and a unique fighting style where he was willing to take a hit just to make sure he got a good hit off himself. After the Egyptian god enhanced his abilities, he got a massive increase to his strength, and there are a couple rare abilities that popped up in the comics, but they weren't consistently used or even referenced very often, possibly just hoping people forget about them. But I didn't forget! And the most notable of those was a rare, not very used ability to drain another person's life force. After taking on the mantle of the Moon Knight, he dresses in all white, and this actually has a purpose, which I'll jump into later. He also has his crescent darts, which he often throws or keeps in his hand to do excessive amounts of damage. We've also regularly seen him with what appears to be a bow staff, although there have been depictions where it's used similar to Daredevil's walking cane. And lastly, he does have a cape that he uses just to glide more gently to the ground when needed. We see him jumping from rooftop to rooftop, and without being able to make a soft landing, he would be taking on quite a bit of damage. Lastly, we really have to mention that since he does have different personalities, one of those personalities is a particularly good detective. While some people try to use this as evidence that maybe he's just another Batman ripoff. He is not the world's greatest detective like Batman, but he does have some skills there, so we have to make sure we note that. Because this is D&D Builds, where we have an outlet to make all sorts of ridiculous builds for D&D 5th Edition and stop driving the people in our lives insane with them. So let's dive into a race, background, and stats. For a race, we're just gonna keep it simple and go human variant. As far as the background, we could take the soldier background, since Mark Spector does have that military experience, but it's kind of hard to avoid the fact that he has a bunch of different identities living in his head. With that in mind, I'm gonna take the Haunted One background, which I know might sound somewhat similar to my Batman build that I did previously, but the reasoning for this is simply because one of the flaws specifically says, I talk to spirits that no one else can see. And that fits a little too perfectly for somebody with dissociative identity disorder to ignore. This background will grant two skill proficiencies, and from that we're gonna grab investigation to cover our detective aspects, and survival, because if there's one thing Mark Spector knows how to do, it's survive. You also get two languages, one of them being exotic. Of the exotic languages, I would take celestial, since you are empowered by a god. You can pick whatever you'd like for that additional language, and from your race choice, you get to pick one more language on top of that. Since I feel like there's a good chance that Mephisto is going to pop up in the Marvel show, I'm just going to grab Infernal, leaving you one additional language to choose from. The last thing I want to touch on with the Haunted One background is that you get some additional equipment, most notably a trinket of special significance. We could say it's something like your crescent darts, but you throw them around willy-nilly, so 
I wouldn't really say it's all that special in significance. Instead, in the comics, we do see Moon Knight utilizing an Ankh that he wears around his neck on occasion. So let's just go ahead and use that as our equipment. And lastly, you get one additional skill proficiency when you get your human race. So I would just grab Perception since that's super valuable to have in D&D. So with the race and background already taken care of, let's jump into some stats. We already noted that Moon Knight does have some enhanced strength. So we're going to bump that all the way up to 15 and then get an additional plus one from our human variant. While he is fairly dexterous, in D&D, dexterity is often used to help reduce the chance that you're going to get hit. And Moon Knight is well known for just taking a hit and keep on coming. So we're going to only put 12 into dexterity for right now. We're going to need a lot of constitution if you need to be able to take a bunch of hits. So we're going to take constitution to 15 and get another plus one from our human variant. Next up we have intelligence and since we need some ability to be able to investigate being some level of detective with one of our personalities, we're going to bump this to 13 and then we're just going to dump wisdom and charisma. Wisdom especially because I think of people that have a fractured mind and D&D &D usually has some sort of sanity related checks usually being tied to wisdom. So we just have to dump it. And while charisma could be useful for intimidation, we don't really have any other use for it. So it's kind of left by the wayside. Now at level one, we have to decide on a class. And we need a class that's able to use pretty much any type of weapon, which leaves us with Barbarian, Fighter, or Paladin. Fighter could be a good choice due to the military training that Mark Spector has got, and Paladin could be a great choice because Paladins tend to utilize powers of the gods to help smite their enemies. But it's really hard to avoid the fact that Moon Knight is so well known for just taking a hit and utilizing it to his advantage as being a major part of his fighting style, to the point that when he went up against Taskmaster, who has the ability to copy anybody's fighting style, he had the most trouble going up against Moon Knight, because Taskmaster can't take a hit like Moon Knight can. Plus, this is part of the reason that Moon Knight wears white. Granted, there's the whole connection to the moon thing, but part of it is because he wants to be the opposite of Batman. Batman hides in the shadows and strikes from stealth. Moon Knight wants all the attention on him and uses that to help protect the innocent because then he takes the hit, nobody else. So with that in mind, there is one class that really exemplifies this and that's a Barbarian. At level one of Barbarian, you get the most hit points to start out of any class in D&D and you're going to need them if you're going to take those hits. You also get access to light and medium armor, as well as shields, and we might need some medium armor just to help us out with the fact that we only have 12 decks. And you also have proficiency with pretty much every weapon, and that's really what we needed. You get proficiency in saving throws and strength and constitution, and then you get two skills. We're going to take athletics and intimidation. Even though we don't have a ton of charisma to back it up, I know I would be intimidated as hell if I saw Moon Knight coming at me. You get some additional starting equipment where you can grab a great axe or any martial weapon as well as any simple weapon. So for a simple weapon, I'm going to grab a dagger. This is going to help us recreate the crescent dart. And while I know there's darts in D&D, darts are usually pretty tiny and the crescent darts that Moon Knight throws are definitely more the size of daggers. Plus he holds on to them on occasion and uses them to reinforce his punches and slash with some melee combat. But because he throws them so often, I think it's time that we utilize that feat we get from being a human variant. We're going to grab the fighter initiate feat and pick up the fighting style thrown weapon fighting. This will help mitigate the lower damage that we get from using a dagger by getting a plus two to the damage roll. Additionally, you'll be able to both pull the weapon and throw it all in one fluid motion. This is super useful since usually in D&D, you're only allowed to draw one weapon per turn as part of a free action, but this gets around that rule. Also at level one of Barbarian, you get Rage. While using Rage, you have advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. And when you make a melee weapon attack using strength, you gain bonus to the damage roll for that attack, which only increases as you gain levels in Barbarian. 
This is going to be pretty useful because if you're attacking with a dagger in your hand, you now get bonuses to the damage you deal in melee as well as when you actually throw the dagger. So you're covered on both bases. And lastly, one of the most important parts of having this rage is you gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. This is going to be very key to that mindset of take a hit and deal a hit. You also get unarmored defense at this level where you get 10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your constitution modifier and you can use that as your armor class. But Moon Knight's suit has been known to be made out of pretty much anything and everything, including vibranium of all things. So with that in mind, we're probably going to rely a bit more on medium armor than we would on the unarmored defense which is kind of needed since we only have that 12 in dex. Then at second level, you get Danger Sense. One ability we didn't mention before that Moon Knight has is having premonitions. He tends to have certain prophecies of things to come. And while Danger Sense isn't exactly a match, it might be able to do the job, at least for right now. We'll be able to circle back to that ability later. And just to really drive home that whole willing to take a hit thing, we have the other ability that barbarians get at second level, reckless attack. This gives you advantage on attacks that you make, but it also puts you at more risk because it gives others the chance to have advantage on attacking you. At third level, you get to choose your primal path, and there's a super obvious choice here. We're going to take Path of the Zealot. This barbarian subclass is from the Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and this specific path mentions that its barbarians are warriors who channel their rage into powerful displays of divine power. Channeling the power of the gods is really like hammering home the idea that you are the Fist of Khonshu. When you take this path, you're granted Divine Fury, allowing your weapon attacks to deal an extra 1d6 of damage plus half of your barbarian level. And this damage is either necrotic or radiant. But I would just stick with radiant since you're channeling the power of the moon. You can only use this once per turn and only while you're raging, but it still drives home the point. You also get the feature Warrior of the Gods, but that doesn't play in quite so much. At fourth level, we get an ability score improvement. So we're just gonna throw that into strength so you can hit a little harder. At fifth level, we get extra attack and fast movement. This will allow you to dart around the battlefield a tiny bit faster, increasing your movement speed by 10 feet. And the extra attack is always gonna be useful. At sixth level, you get fanatical focus, allowing the power of your divine nature to help you in a saving throw while you're raging. If you fail a saving throw, you can reroll it, but you can only use this ability once per rage. At seventh level, you get feral instinct, giving you advantage on initiative rolls and allowing you to enter a rage right away in battle, even if you're surprised. At eighth level, we get another ability score improvement. So we're just gonna max out our strength here. At ninth level, we get brutal critical. While the damage you do with daggers or even a bow staff in this situation is somewhat minimal compared to something like a great ax where you can do a D12 of damage, it's still notable to be able to deal one additional dice worth of damage when you crit. And anyone that really reads the comics would know Moon Knight can definitely be brutal. I mean, there's even a point where he cuts somebody's face off. Also at this level, you get to boost your rage damage by an additional one, meaning you get plus three to your melee damage while raging. At 10th level, you get Zealous Presence. As a bonus action, you can unleash a battle cry infused with divine energy. This will give you and your allies advantage on attack rolls and saving throws until the start of your next turn. At level 11, you get Relentless Rage, and you're gonna need this with all the hits you take. If you drop to zero hit points while you're raging and you don't die outright, you can make a DC 10 con saving throw. If you succeed, you drop to one hit point instead. Each time you use this feature after the first, the DC is increased by five, so you can keep using it, but the likelihood you're gonna keep surviving is gonna go down and down. At 12th level, you get another ability score improvement, so we're gonna bump our constitution to 18, so you can hopefully take a few more hits. Then at 13th level, you get another brutal critical, so you get one additional dice when you crit, just making you a little extra vicious. Just to add to this, at level 14, 
you get the divine power that fuels your rage, allowing you to shrug off fatal blows. Rage beyond death. So after you wind up getting to the point where you start failing those con saves, having zero hit points doesn't actually knock you unconscious. You still make death saving throws, and you suffer the normal effects of taking damage while at zero hit points. However, if you would die due to failing a death saving throw, you don't die until your rage ends and you die then only if you still have zero hit points. So somebody could come in and just heal you while you're fighting with an empty tank. At level 15, you get persistent rage, meaning that you only turn off your rage when you feel like it or if you get knocked unconscious. But with everything keeping you standing, the chances you're actually gonna get knocked out are pretty slim. At 16, we get another ability score improvement, and we could finally boost our decks up to 14, allowing us to finally utilize the plus two you usually get from medium armor. But like I said, he utilizes taking those hits. So instead, I want to make sure I reference the fact that he was a boxer, and we're going to take fighting initiate again, grabbing the fighting style, unarmed fighting. You aren't going to be able to utilize your rage damage since you're not actually attacking with a melee weapon anymore, but at least now you can hit either way. This will allow you to hit with 1d6 of damage plus your strength modifier, and if you aren't wielding any other weapons or a shield, when you make the attack, the damage goes from a d6 to a d8. And at the start of each of your turns, you can deal a 1d4 of damage to any one creature you're grappled with. And hopefully you won't need to utilize that too much, because the rage damage that you get at this level boosts up another one point, meaning that you get a plus four to all the damage that you do with a melee weapon, at least while you're using your strength. And at level 18, you get Indomitable Might. So if you make a strength check and it's less than your strength score, you can use your strength score instead. And considering you have a 20, that means you're very unlikely to ever fail a strength check. So here's where things are gonna get a little more tricky. But before I dive into that, I have to make sure I note that Moon Knight does use a few other weapons at times. And with that bow staff and its ability to kind of convert into other shapes and ways to utilize it, I think we should just kind of cover our bases. We have the bow staff itself, so that's pretty simple. We just grab a quarter staff. If you want to have the bow staff have a bit of a floppy end to it, you can pretend it's a flail. And if you plan on really whipping it around with the extended wire coming out of it, then you can pretend it's a whip. All of these you can utilize your strength for and use as a barbarian. Usually we're going to rely on our crescent darts, but I just wanted to make sure we covered our bases. Now, finally, how it gets a little tricky here, I don't really like the whole thing where we just use danger sense to encompass all of the ideas around having prophecies or visions of the future. So with that in mind, we're going to use that intelligence that we put a few points into earlier and multi-class into wizard. So at level 19 of this build, we're going to take our first level of wizard. You get three cantrips and with one level of wizard and the plus one intelligence modifier we have, you can also learn two spells. While there are a few cantrips you can take, you can grab Booming Blade just to make sure you hit with a real epic slam. And then what I would really focus on is Sapping Sting. I know that the ability to drain another person's life force was very rarely mentioned in the comics, and it only popped up for a very short period of time, but I can't help but want to use some sort of reference to it. And with Sapping Sting, you sap the vitality of one creature that you can see in range. The target must exceed a constitution saving throw, or take 1d4 necrotic damage and fall prone. This is boosted up, and by this level in the build, it's actually 4d4. It's not a lot of damage, but it at least covers our bases. The only other spell we could use to pull off this general concept is Enervation, but Enervation does require a fifth level spell, and we don't really want to go that deep into the magic. And just to not get too magical with the build, despite the fact that you're empowered by an Egyptian god, I would just take True Strike. This will really utilize the idea that you're pretty darn good at hitting your target. I mean, there's even points in the comic where Moon Knight's accuracy can practically make Bullseye jealous. And the two spells I would get at this first level are ones that we want to make sure that we can actually use while being a barbarian. 
because while you're raging, you can't cast spells or concentrate on spells. So with that in mind, we're gonna take Jump. This spell lasts for a minute, it doesn't require concentration, and a creature's jump distance is tripled until the spell ends. And with all of the jumping rooftop to rooftop, this is gonna be pretty darn useful. And just because I like diving way too much into the specifics, Mark Spector is listed on Marvel's website as being six foot three. With a strength score of 20 and having the spell jump, that means your running long jump is 60 feet horizontally or 24 feet vertically. And even without a running start, you can jump 30 feet horizontally and 12 feet straight up in the air. You can actually reach up and grab something 21.3 feet off the ground. And if you had a running start on that, you can actually grab something 33.3 feet off the ground. Just because I like looking at the numbers. But as I was making this video, I just so happened to stumble across a video by a channel called Pack Tactics, where they were talking about in D&D you really shouldn't jump. And the reason is, jumping doesn't negate your fall damage. You take 1d6 of fall damage for every 10 feet you fall. It's weird that it's not accounted for, and many DMs might ignore it since it is kind of weird, but if you do wind up using your high jump with your current strength score plus the jump spell, coming back down to the ground will force you to take an extra 2d6 of damage. And while Moon Knight doesn't mind taking some damage, I know in a few campaigns gravity has been the death of my character more than once. So I think the next perfect spell we can grab will help mitigate this, and that's Featherfall. Which is probably going to be the best way we can recreate gliding with your cloak. You don't need to legitimately fly or use it for much else, so gliding gently to the ground using Featherfall is pretty much the best way we can pull this off. And at level 2 of Wizard, we get one additional spell to choose from, and we get an Arcane Tradition. And you can probably grab whatever really makes your inner Marvel superhero feel best. You can grab Absorb Elements to take those hits and turn them around on your enemies a little better. Or you could take Disguise Self, since most heroes rely on a disguise. But I would probably lean into Cause Fear. Your chances of actually making this work are pretty slim since your intelligence score is a little low, but I kind of just like the idea of causing fear in your enemies and I do personally find Moon Knight to be pretty darn intimidating, so this is what I would go with. And now we get to pick an arcane tradition, and there's two arcane traditions that go hand in hand when it comes to seeing glimpses of the future, that's Chronergy and Divination. But Chronergy kind of leans a bit more on altering the flow of time, where divination's more about seeing the future. So I would grab the Wizard School of Divination. This should cover your ability to have prophecies and visions of the future with their feature portent. This feature allows you to have small glimpses of the future. It grants you two d20s that you get at the end of a long rest. You roll them when you wake up as if you're seeing what's going to happen and then you can use those rolls later throughout your day. That brings us to level 20 in this build, and even with a couple squishy levels of wizard, you finish off this build with 219 hit points. So you can take those hits and keep on coming, allowing you to really fight like Moon Knight. I'm really excited for Marvel's new Moon Knight show to come out, so I had to do this build. If you're excited about Moon Knight coming out, or if you would change anything in this build, let me know in the comments down below. Also, if you have an idea about future builds, don't hesitate to let me know because they're super useful and I really love taking fan requests on these. If you want a character sheet for any of my builds, they're all going up on my Patreon, link down below, where you can also get the chance to have a D&D session hosted by me. If you like this kind of content and all sorts of D&D 5th edition builds, feel free to subscribe, I try and post every single week. If you made it all the way to the end of my video, let me know by hitting that like button. It really helps the channel, and I'll be here hoping you get at least three nat 20s on your next D&D session, especially if you're embodying the fist of Khonshu himself with this Moon Knight build.